Um, I am continuing, as I said, in this series of sermons about rediscovering our Methodist roots. And today, the topic is holy conferencing. And there is much debate and confusion about what holy conferencing really means. Some think that holy conferencing is just what we do when we have arguments with one another. And... <laughs> that we need to try to resolve those, that it is all about conflict resolution. But holy conferencing is much more than that. Holy conferencing is something that I believe we need to reclaim as the people called Methodist. So I hope to touch on it today and encourage you to do more reading and conversations in each one of these topics for certainly during these sermons, we're not able to touch on the depth and breadth of each one of these points of United Methodism. There is a play that was written by Channing Pollock in which Archie comes home tired and beat. He's been down in their village taking a courageous stand against government officials who are about to do something that he believes is unethical concerning a proposed housing project. And he refused to give in to the government officials' ways. He stood his ground, despite derision and scorn. And when he comes home, his wife can tell that he's disappointed and he's distressed at what took place. And he looks at his wife, Jennifer, and he says, I'm not a big man, Jen. And so she asked him a very important question. She says, what is a big man, Archie? And Archie thinks for a moment and he says, well, someone like Henry Ford, I guess. Somebody who's made a name for themselves. And his wife responds, no, Archie. A big man is a man who keeps his soul. A man who keeps his soul. And she was right. Big people are those who can keep their soul in this world. And I thought about that as I read the scripture, the scripture lesson for today that Anne so beautifully shared with the children. is from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. It's recorded for us in Colossians chapter 3. And this portion begins at verse 12. Paul wrote, Therefore, as God's choice and holy loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts. A peace into which you were called into one body. And be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in speech or in action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I dare say each one of us, in the sound of my voice, want to live by these words. That's the kind of life we aspire to as disciples of Jesus Christ. But the reality is 
that there are more and more opportunities in our world every day. Opportunities to compromise our beliefs and our standards, to compromise our virtues, to cheat and to lie and to betray one another, to gossip about others, to demean others, to violate our marriage vows, to become sloppy in our devotional life, and to become careless with the truth. We see it every day, and it seeps into our lives. Every day, each one of us flirts with the possibility of losing our souls, little by little, as we fall in to those temptations. And so I want to spend time thinking about this theme of keeping our souls, for I believe that is at the heart of what John Wesley was talking about when he said we should engage in holy conferencing. You see, a big part of the history of all humankind is that there is a gap between what people want to live, their ideas about the way they want to live their life, and the reality of how they live their life. Think about King David. King David, the scriptures say, was a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. And yet the scriptures tell us that he fell into the temptation of committing adultery. And out of his guilt, he goes deeper in that sin by arranging for Uriah to be put to death. So this hero of Israel, a singer of God's songs of praise and trust, confidence in God's unending love, listen to what he moans in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, Lord, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight." None of us, none of us are exempt from the possibility of lapsing in our desire to follow Christ. Remember probably the two most well-known disciples of the original 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, Judas and Peter. Judas thought he knew what was best. That's why he wanted to sell Jesus into the hands of the authorities. Peter thought his strength of commitment to Jesus would never fail, that he would never doubt Jesus or deny knowing him. He thought that would sustain throughout his life. But these two also teach us that none of us are exempt from the possibility of moral and spiritual failure. Our task as a body of faith is to be vigilant in keeping our souls. And sadly, there are too many in the world today, in my belief, who are loudly proclaiming that the only way to keep our souls is to believe in the right theology as they define it, keeping the rules as they define them. I read recently of this big push saying that all evangelical Christians are the only Christians. And if you put another adjective in front of the word Christian, you are not a true Christian. My friends, it is true that many of us do not know the words of Scripture as well as we should. 
I am reminded of an old preacher's story that many of you may have heard. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times. It's about sh soldiers who were in a foxhole, and it's looking pretty grim. And so the Methodist among them says, well, maybe we should pray. And the Presbyterian says, well, I learned the Lord's Prayer when I was a kid. And the Methodist says, well, I'll give you $5 that you can't say it now. And so the Presbyterian said, I sure can. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And the Methodist reached in his pocket and said, here's your $5. I really didn't think you could do it. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed because you know neither one of them was right. <laughs> but the sad truth is that too many Methodists lack a clarity about their faith, about what it is that we believe. If somebody asked us what a Methodist is, we'd stumble, stumble and stammer around and have a hard time defining what a Methodist is for them. John Wesley, in starting the Methodist Church, understood this struggle that we might have. And he tried to remedy the situation. He tried to remedy our knowledge of scripture and the way that we live our life, keeping our souls together and keeping us grounded in our faith. He did that by forming what he called societies and classes, groups of people who were asked to hold each other accountable for their souls. He tried to create situations in which somebody could look in the, to the eye of another who followed Christ and say not to that person, how is the weather today and what was the score on the ball game this past weekend and who's running for office in the community, but to simply ask, how is it with your soul? Because, you see, it's one thing to inquire about the weather and just do chit-chat, nice chit-chat with one another, but it's quite another thing to ask someone else, how is it with your soul? Wesley established those class meetings to provide fellowship where one loving heart could set another loving heart on fire. It was a class meeting that brought the people together and conserved the revival preaching that Wesley's and others began to help people to grow closer to God and closer to one another. Those meetings Wesley encouraged were called Christian conferencing, which today has been translated to holy conferencing. Wesley defined Methodist during his life as people who unite together to encourage and help each other in working out their salvation, and for that end, watch over one another in love. It is one of the means of grace, Wesley thought, one of the ways that we grow closer to God and closer to one another, one of the ways the Holy Spirit works in our lives to help us to do that, along with prayer and studying the scripture and Holy Communion. He believed in Christian conferencing. Christian conferencing is not simply to be seen as a way to have polite conversations and to be nice to one another. Christian conferencing is a way for us to talk with each other about God and our faith. One of my seminary professors once said that too often we do not know how to use God as the subject of our verbs and talk about where have I seen God at work in this world? Where is God at work in my life? It is one of those channels in which we are able to learn how to make God the subject of our verbs and to become more aware of the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives. It takes trust. It takes trusting and growing close enough to others that we open up and we're willing to be vulnerable about who we really are and to share with others about where we mess up and where we need help and where we struggle and where we have doubts. 
And that's why Sunday school classes are so important. That's why we started so many small groups this past year. Some may look at our small groups and think, Tabitha's table, they get together and they sew, and that's great. But you know what else happens? Christian conferencing. They learn to trust each other as they share their life's journey with one another, sharing their hopes and their fears, their worries and their stresses as they pray for one another, and they share scriptures with one another, not in a conscripted way, but in a natural way that just comes about as they learn to care for one another deeply. The same thing happens in many of the small groups as we learn how to live together, learn how to share with one another. You remember the old story about three students who were discussing various versions of the Bible years ago? One said, I like the new revised standard version of the Bible the best. It's easier to read than those older versions like the King James Version. And then a second student said, well, no, I like the modern version called the message. It's very easy to read and is pithy and to the point. I use it in my daily prayers. And the third student surprised them all when the third student said, well, I like my mother's version the best. She translates her Bible into actions every day. I like that. As others have so aptly said, you may be the only Bible others read. If we are grounded in Scripture and if we live out our lives in conversation with one another and share with one another, we all grow closer to God and closer to one another. I'm sure all of you remember Jesus telling the disciples, telling us that we are to be the salt of the earth. Jesus said, if salt loses its savor or flavor, it gets tossed out. And the people of Jesus' day understood exactly what he was talking about, but we've lost some of the understanding of the value of that scripture in our day and time when we just pull out the shaker of Morton salt and dump it anywhere we want. In that part of the world at that time, salt was collected from around the Dead Sea. And the salt crystals were often mixed and contaminated with other minerals and impurities. And since the salt was more soluble in the rain than the other impurities, the rainwater would wash out and dissolve the salt. And so the salt would lose its saltiness. Unsalty salt was worthless. And if you gave it to someone, they'd probably throw it on the ground, just like Jesus said, and it would be trampled underfoot. Well, the Greek word that is used for unsalty salt is the word moreno. And that's the root word moron. <laughs> Think about it. Christians who are contaminated by worldly attitudes and try to witness out of that, who are not clothed in those beautiful qualities that Paul talks about, are just like morons. We are called to be grounded in our faith and to be connected to one another, where we can continue to grow in our faith and encourage one another in that growing in our faith. My friends, it matters so much who we hang around with. It matters so much what sites we visit on the Internet and what books and magazines we read and what television shows we watch. And I'm all one for having a breadth of understanding of the world. But we need to be careful to always question, how is it with my soul to be grounded when we gather together, we help one another and we encourage one another. We hold each other accountable to the beliefs that sustain us so that when we're ready to go back into the world, others will see Christ in us and through us. Fellowship, Christian conferencing, is one of the ways that the early church began. 
And if you look through the scriptures, you'll notice that there are more than 50 one another passages. Passages in the New Testament that tell us how we are to gather together in daily Christian conferencing with one another. Here's just a few of them. We are to encourage one another, to be devoted to one another, to build up one another, to be kind to one another, to live in harmony with one another, to accept one another, to serve one another, to confess our sins to one another, to pray for one another, to not judge one another, and to not slander one another. It's a way of life, a way of treating others. Christian conferencing, as defined by United Methodist, is a place where we unite together to encourage and help one another work out our salvation. And we do it in love, my friends. We do it in love. I want to thank you for the ways that you do engage in Christian conferencing with one another in this great con congregation. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that, to grow in your breadth and knowledge of the Holy Scriptures and to grow in your love and connections with one another and to keep before you that question, how is it with my soul? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.